Welcome to the Jenna Colborn Show. Very excited to have you in and please go ahead and hit share. Let your friends know that we're live this afternoon. We have a great, a meaningful and a deep show lined up for you today. When I started this show, it was to discuss the topics that we're not supposed to talk about. The things that were hushed about, that those um, taboo topics. Well, one of those topics has long been stillbirth and pregnancy loss. For generations, this has been a hushed, quiet topic, not something to be discussed, not something to be brought up. If you knew a family who had experienced pregnancy loss, you weren't to bring it up. You just nodded your head at them in silence as you walked by the grocery store. But this mentality grew to a culture of shame and the inability to process grief. Stillbirths occur in about seven out of every 1,000 births in Canada, according to Statistics Canada. In Alberta, provincial stillbirth rates are 6.1 out of every 1,000 born. If you're looking at the Bonneville Hospital, the Bonneville Hospital alone sees one to three stillborn babies with around 300 births at the Bonneville Hospital per year. So it's definitely something that's happening. It's happening in your community and it's likely that you know a family who has experienced a stillborn baby. Today, we're gonna to be talking about a new service that the Bonneville Hospital has for families who have gone through and have experienced a stillborn baby. And that is these really cool cuddle cots. I'm gonna tell you what a cuddle cot is and how it extends the time that families are able to grieve with their babies. We're also going to be sitting down with Ashley Hempel. She's a local photographer and a local mother. And sadly, in 2014, she experienced a stillborn child. We'll talk about that experience as well as the two rainbow babies that came to follow. Please stick around for the Jenna Colborn Show. Hit share, let your friends know that we're live this morning and whether or this afternoon and whether you're watching live with us or you're watching the rebroadcast later on, please share and let your friends know. We'll be right back on the Jenna Colburn Show. Muse Inspired in Cold Lake is not your average clothing store. You'll discover unique brands like Sandwich, Pavillon, Camp, Dex, Spiritual Gangster, and more. Accessorize your outfit with shoes, bags, outerwear, and jewelry. Find one-of-a-kind gift ideas and don't miss out on their monthly sip and shop. Follow them on Facebook and Instagram to get inspired. Muse Inspired in Cold Lake and online museinspiredboutique.com. Welcome back to the Jenna Colborn Show. Today I'm joined by Ashley Hempel and we're discussing perinatal loss as well as stillbirths and unfortunately in 2015, on 14. May 2014, on May 1st, you had a child stillborn and I was hoping you could share your story today with us. Yeah. Um, yes. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah, I had my little guy Sawyer. He was 39 weeks um, so like literally a week before his due date and I had noticed earlier in the day that I hadn't felt a lot of activity from him around like 11 o'clock in the morning I was like like what like usually he was really active and you know you kind of get used to the idea like people tell you that well when your babies are running out of room they don't get like they don't kick as much they don't wiggle around as much which is true they don't do like those big big movements but you should still be feeling movement and you had had previous Four, to three this, before three before so yeah. you, you kind of been through this before but you still felt like hey something's not right here yeah I was I was a little concerned and so um, I had my own home Doppler which a lot of women do nowadays and I find I think that they're kind of dangerous because you can, should not use them as a diagnostic device um, and that's exactly what I did. I stood up, I took my little Doppler, I put it on my stomach, I found his heartbeat right away. It was hovering around 135, which was normal for him. Um, so I listened to him for like, I don't know, maybe 30 seconds, and then I put the Doppler down. And then I didn't think about it again. Mm -hmm. And um, it's hard because I know like hindsight is 2020. but if I hadn't had the Doppler, I would have just gone to the hospital 
like, you know, I would have gone and got checked out. Been like, you know, I'm not really sure. I don't think I felt him move in the last hour or whatever. Because all we know, all a heartbeat tells us is that he was alive at that point. Mm -hmm. So then um, <laughs> I went about my day. I did a bunch of editing. I made some food, like kind of freezer meal prepped, whatever, and had a nap, like didn't really think much of anything. And then that evening I it was like, I don't know, maybe 1030. I couldn't sleep. And I was like, you know, I'm just going to go. I'm gonna, and this is again, like another hindsight moment, but I, but it feels like it was a real memory where I was like, I'm going to go to 7-Eleven and get a slush because I just want one, whatever. And so it's like 10.30 at night and I'm going to get a slush at 7-Eleven. And there was like this moment where I was like about to turn to go to 7-Eleven and I had like this little inkling of a thought where I was like, I should go to the hospital maybe. But then immediately I was like, this is your fourth baby. You're being dramatic. There's nothing wrong. Everything is fine. They're going to tell you that everything is fine. It's also worth noting too that about a month before I'd had a similar circumstance where I hadn't felt much movement from him. I went in, they gave me a cookie and everything was okay. So I kind of had that also playing in my head like this is everything's going to be fine, everything's going to be fine. And the first time that that had happened and you got the cookie, did you leave the hospital feeling like, "Hey, that was the right move for me?" or did you leave feeling a little like, "Oh, you know, I kind of wasted people's time." I felt like I wasted people's time. They didn't make me feel that way, but that was just how I felt. And I thought I would bring it up because I think a lot of people feel that way. Yeah. They feel like they're wasting a doctor's time or they're wasting a nurse's time, but it's important how you said they didn't make me feel that way. So they didn't, they, they really didn't. Like there was no, like I had gone in and I was like, and even when I went in, I was like, I'm, I'm, I'm a little concerned. I don't know. I haven't felt much movement today. Like we were running around a lot, but I haven't felt much movement today. And then they were like, okay, they put me on the little non-stress test machine, whatever his heart rate was. Like it, he would have decelerations, which just usually means that there's like a cord wrapped or something. Um, and so they kept me there for like an hour just to make sure that everything was kind of evening out and gave me some cookies and I clicked a little button to show every time he kicked and everything was fine and I went home. Um, so this time, the day that we lost him, which was April, April 29th, um, I did not go to the hospital. I went and got a slush and some candy and went home and laid on my couch and watched uh, The Voice, like pre-recorded episodes of The Voice mm -hmm. with my husband. And it was about midnight and all of a sudden I was like, I have been laying here not doing anything for like an hour and a half and drinking a slush, which like cold and sugar, and I haven't felt anything. Like I'm sure I haven't felt any movement. And so I grabbed my Doppler and I looked for his heartbeat and I couldn't find it. Um, I found mine, which was like, I don't know, 98 or something like that. It was racing. It was racing. And um, I convinced myself that it was his. Mm -hmm. Like I convinced myself, I was like, no, he must be in distress. Like this is low for a baby, but he's fine. Like, and then even then I sat there and I was like, maybe I should go to the hospital. I don't know. And I went back and forth for probably 30 minutes. And then I, and my husband fell asleep. Like he fell asleep on the couch. Like he's like, are you going or aren't you? Like, what is the plan? And I was like, mm -hmm. you know what? You go to bed, you have to work tomorrow. I'm just gonna call the hospital and I'll go in. So I called them ahead of time and, and same thing. I'm like, hey, don't wanna bug you. This is what's going on. Um, my baby's heart rate's really low. It's like 98 and I don't know what's going on, but I'm wondering if I should come in or maybe there's something wrong with my Doppler. Like, I don't know. And they were like, yeah, you should come in. Like they were really calm about it, whatever. Mm -hmm. So I was like, I'm going to go. I'll be back in like an hour. They're going to tell me nothing's wrong. I'll be and fine. And you went alone. And I went by myself. And I mean, if I didn't have three kids at home, probably he would have came with me. Mm -hmm. So I went by myself. And when I got to the hospital, because it was late, I had to go in through the emergency room doors. So somebody was waiting for me to take me to labor and delivery area. Um, and... And they took me in there and like, so you know how they give you like a non-stress test, like they have you change into a, a robe or whatever mm -hmm. and whatever. So they didn't do that. They had me go in and they had me give them like a urine sample right away. And then instead of having me change, she was like, just sit on the bed. And she pulled my shirt up and put this thing on my stomach, like didn't even strap it around or anything. And I had like this feeling inside of me when I was sitting there that I was like something is wrong 
but at the same time, I'm like, nope, you're just being dramatic. There's nothing wrong. And the volume was way down. So I couldn't hear his heartbeat because there wasn't one. And I had commented on that. I was like, I can't hear anything. And she was like, oh no, the volume's just broken on this one. But I'm, you know, I'm looking. She's like, so, so the nurse was shielding you. Yeah. And so she's like, um, he's head down. And I, or she said, was he head down? And I said, yeah, he was last time. And she goes, you know, I'm just going to call the doctor that's on call and uh, we'll get her to come in. And she, they have like a little ultrasound machine or whatever. She's like, I don't even know that he's head down right now. So it might, that might be why we're having a hard time finding him. And I'm like, okay. And then again, and I'm accepting that even though mm -hmm. I know that when you have a 39 week baby, you can find their heartbeat anywhere. It does not, it's not like 12 weeks when you have to like look in a specific spot. And I was like, okay, yeah, sure. So I called one of my friends who was, um, so it's Kimberly with Cass Images. She's a really close friend of mine and she, the plan had been for her to come down and do labor and delivery photos. So I just kind of wanted to let her know what was going on. Cause I was like, maybe I'm having a C-section tonight. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't know what's happening. And both of us were like, yeah, everything's fine. And we're making jokes and like, whatever, like it was just, and then the doctor came in and so she walked into the room and she set up the ultrasound machine. She sat next to me and I could see over her shoulder. I could see him over her shoulder and she was looking around and I was like, do you see any movement? And she was like, with this ultrasound, we're just looking to see if there's any heartbeat. And I could see over her shoulder and I said, and you don't, you don't see any. And she was like, no. And then I, lost it like completely broke down um I've never felt that kind of grief before where like I just I just wanted everything I just wanted to take everything back um and she's like trying to <laughs> trying to get me to you know like she's like rubbing my shoulder and trying to get me to calm down like not telling me to calm down or anything mm -hmm. but whatever trying to console. yeah trying to console and she's like um do you want to call anybody and like who can we call or who could whatever and I was like no like we're not calling anyone because this isn't happening mm -hmm. and I remember looking at her and again like completely insane and I was like I have three children at home that are waiting for a baby brother like pick somebody else like this isn't happening to me this isn't happening to me and yeah and so then um so I had to get a hold of my mom to get her to go to get a hold of my husband because he was sleeping and he doesn't wake up to the phone ringing. Mm -hmm. And so she had to go there and get him. So then I got to relive, like I had to tell him that I had lost our baby. And that's like, that's how it felt. Like it mm -hmm. felt like I had done this because I had checked in the morning and I had had concerns and then completely just let myself believe that everything was going to be okay because it was three other times. And I think we do that. I think in any um, dramatic situation, any traumatic situation, there's this voice that's an eternal optimist that will calm you and tell you everything's okay, there is nothing wrong. And I think it's a protective mechanism that everybody has built into themselves. Yeah. And on the other side of things, having two children of my own, I never used a Doppler. I didn't think to own one. So it's cool that you did have one, but for me, I don't know if I would have noticed. And I'm trying to think back like with my pregnancies mm -hmm. and thinking back to, you know, 39 weeks, would I have noticed? So that blame, I'm sure you lived with for some time. Yeah. But I hope, there's been ways that you've released yourself of that. I, I mean, I guess again, it's like, there was no way to know what was happening. Um, even if, and I mean, like I've, like I've talked to doctors and I've talked to like, cause afterwards, like, cause we did end up getting pregnant again. And so that was a conversation that we had later was, like, well, how do we know that he's going to be safe? And it was like, well, if you do your kit counts, um, then when there's, like the situation that Sawyer had was, um, 
So he had a hypercoiled umbilical cord, um, which means that it looked like a telephone cord. Okay. It was like really twisted, like an old telephone cord, and it was also five and a half feet long. And if they had uncoiled it, it would have been longer. Mm -hmm. So it was just like kind of a genetic defect, abnormality of some sort that none of the other kids had. had. Um, and so what they believe happened is that he compressed his cord. And so you have about 24 hours roughly from the time that they compress their cord before they pass away. So like they have said to me that like you don't know when that happened. All I know is that at 11 o'clock his mm -hmm. heart was beating. Like maybe we would have gone to the hospital and nothing, there wouldn't have been anything they could do at that point. Like mm -hmm. who knows? Um, definitely, I've definitely had to forgive myself because you know, as a mom, like you just mm -hmm. have like that mom guilt about everything. Your like, kid could be 40 and get hurt and you're, you're in another province or five away and, and you, you blame. blame yourself. Yeah. I, I understand mom guilt and um, if you're willing I wanted to go back to when Sawyer yeah. was born and you had called Kimberly your friend and she mm -hmm. came down and something I thought was incredibly brave of you because I've been following your story since 2014 and an incredibly brave moment and one of the first times I've ever seen someone share their story came from you and you posted a photo of Sawyer and I'm just going to post it on our screen here and this is you, Sawyer you had Kimberly come down and take the photo of him there mm -hmm. and then we also you also posted a picture of you holding Sawyer right after he was born and it was something just so incredibly brave Ashley I like I said I've never s seen someone do what you did and put your story out there and I think there's so much taboo around the there topic is. about pregnancy loss that it was incredibly brave of you and you helped a community of women <sighs> process while you were processing your grief as well. I, uh, it was interesting too because um, I didn't, like I didn't want to tell anyone. Mm -hmm. I didn't want, because then it's real. Um, and if it wasn't for the fact that because I'm a photographer and I was like, my pregnancy was like all over my social media and everything. Like I had people messaging me and asking me like, you know, baby yet, baby yet, baby yet. Like literally mm -hmm. even the day that we lost him, like before I knew that he'd passed away. Um, and yeah, I, I didn't want to say anything to anybody, but I felt like I had to because everybody was waiting for a baby like everybody mm -hmm. so it was kind of like I definitely didn't at the point at that time I definitely didn't intend to be helping a community of women go through anything I was mm -hmm. like this is what happened and we loved him so much and he was so wanted and it's so unfair that he's gone and um, and I, I'm pretty sure in the first post I was like please give us our space like I don't want to talk to mm -hmm. anyone like and and that's not what happened. Um, so many women reached out to me and told me about their losses that they hadn't shared. And like, because yeah, like there's this whole thing about if you, like, you're not supposed to even tell anybody you're pregnant before 12 weeks, because if you lose like something, like if you lose a baby before 12 weeks, it's not going to matter as much to you. Like, I, I don't I heard understand. That too. Like, I that's, heard eight weeks, 12 weeks, whatever the weeks were. And that was my same thinking behind it is, well, is, am I protecting them? Because there was like, do you really want to tell people you've lost yeah. the baby? And it's like, yeah, I suppose I would. So I found um, you have bounced our community light years ahead of where it was um, just simply by sharing that photo. And I'm not sure if that was your intention. It sounds like it was just, hey, everybody, <laughs> this is what happened. But it definitely helped a lot. And if I look back on 2014 and then look forward to today in 2021, where later on the program we're going to be discussing cuddle cots to think of how far we've come in this process. No, it definitely, and I would definitely say that, um, like, we have come very far in this process, even to the point where, um, like, the way that the clinic is handling loss now, like, mm -hmm. there are even early loss. It's, mm -hmm. it's a lot more sensitive now versus before, where it was kind of like, 
you know, you had a spontaneous abortion or whatever it was that they would mm -hmm. call it. And now it's a little bit more tender, so that's nice. Um, but I definitely think like it, it, I believe that Sawyer's story did open up conversations about um, prenatal loss and stillbirth. There was two other babies that were born at the same time that I lost him that were stillborn. Wow. And nobody knew anything. Like, I mean, obviously their close family and friends did, but it's like, this is something that happens way more frequently than anybody thinks about. Mm -hmm. And, um, and the other thing, when you have a baby at 39 weeks that is stillborn, you still get to deliver your baby. So I had to be induced mm -hmm. and I had to deliver my baby. And I think that's one of the hardest realities that people don't realize. It's probably around 19, 20 weeks that um, you do have to deliver your baby. You are induced. You go through yeah. labor. You go through all of that. And many people say, and the nurses even said to me, you're going to get a baby afterwards, so you can do this. And that was part of the motivation. So I cannot imagine um, that side. And I think that's not talked about that, hey, we have to go through labor. Yeah, it was like, just like you said, like, you know, you're, that's your motivation is you're going to have a baby at the end of this. But, um, and I remember saying in one of my, because I was on morphine and Ativan and whatever, um, I remember saying to Dustin, I think that it was kind of like, there's no pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. Mm -hmm. Like I'm doing all of this and I'm not going to get anything. And it was, it was so hard. Um, and I'm, I'm really, I'm really excited about the cuddle cots. Cause one of the things that was so hard was like when he was born, he was, he just looked like a little sleeping angel. Like he was perfect. There was nothing wrong with him. Um, and then within a few hours, he started to change. Like, and that's the reality of what happens. Mm -hmm. And we will be talking about the cuddle cots a little later on, <laughs> on the show, but I wanted to talk about your rainbow. I wanted to talk about Liam. So, um, a rainbow baby, let's explain that first. A rainbow baby is a baby born after a miscarriage or a stillbirth mm -hmm. and the timeline kind of lines up to had there not been a miscarriage or a stillbirth the rainbow baby would not be here yeah that's that's kind of what happened um yeah we were blessed with liam um i found out i was pregnant with him at the beginning of november we'd started trying again right away because i was kind of insane but <laughs> that was, so it would have been, Sawyer would have been six months. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, and we found out that we were pregnant with him. It was the most terrifying pregnancy I've ever been through. I was convinced every day that I was going to lose him. I was like every single day. Um, and I, yeah, like it was, oh, it was so awful. Like even the first time I felt him kick, then there was like this juxtaposition of the last time I felt Sawyer kick, where it was mm -hmm. like, I remember, like I, yeah, it was really hard. It was a really, really hard pregnancy. Did you use your Doppler? Um, I did, but I only used it, I did use it, but I only used it um, because I wanted to hear his heartbeat and kind of bond with him that way yeah, and sure. not, and not, not to make sure he was okay. Not mm -hmm. to, no, what I did, the tool that I used that I found was the most helpful for me um, was there's this app that you can get on your phone called Count the Kicks. And so when they talk about kick counting in pregnancy, typically mm -hmm. it's like if you think something's wrong with your baby, put your feet up, drink a glass of water. If you don't get to 10 kicks in two hours, go to the hospital. Okay. Probably everything's fine, but they could be sleeping, right? Mm -hmm. um, so with this Count the Kicks monitor, uh, you set a time, so your baby's busiest time of day which for me with Liam was like 10 p.m. Mm -hmm. um, and you set a timer, it goes off. And so all you do is you open up this app, there's like a little blue foot and you just like, every time you feel a kick, not a hiccup, but every time you feel a kick, you just hit this button. And as soon as you get to 10, you're done. And the nice thing about this is that, so for women like me who are like, well, I don't wanna go in because I think I'm wasting the doctor's time, whatever. If you have a baseline showing that your baby is super active, you can get to these 10 kicks within 15 seconds, which is pretty frequent during act active times. 
um, and then you have a day where that's not happening, mm -hmm. then they're, it, 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 it's not that they're more likely to take you seriously. They're going to take you seriously regardless, but it's something for you to feel like you have a reason to go in like that you have a reason to advocate and you're not wasting people's time. So you're time. not saying, telling yourself everything's fine. Don't yeah. worry about it. It's kind of a third party. I don't even know who made this app. Yeah. But they're saying go in, so I should go in. Exactly. And so uh, that was actually how I stayed sane with Liam. I started doing that at like 20 weeks. Um, the Bonneville Clinic was amazing. They had, uh, when I found out I was pregnant with him, we made a plan right away. They said that I would not have to be pregnant past 38 weeks if I didn't want to be. Um, and then they partnered with... Uh, the high center in Edmonton and so they did shared care so I would go and see the specialist in the high center and um, then like every other week or whatever every two weeks I would have an ultrasound or a non-stress test like right up until the end I saw my baby all the time <laughs> and I wanted to share his photo because yeah. um, you're a photographer by trade and you yes. took this amazing photo of Liam in his rainbow blanket yeah. and there he is he looks like he's about a day or two old in that <laughs> one <laughs> tiny yeah he um, was I think he was like three days old <laughs> just adorable and you've since had another baby after mm -hmm. Liam Charlotte yeah yeah so um, two little rainbows was it a little easier with Charlotte or it kind of was like a little but mm -hmm. it's hard because so with having a stillbirth after having three healthy babies um, you don't have that you don't have that sense of like like okay so you know that you can have babies mm -hmm. but you also know that you can lose them mm -hmm. and so with Liam I was convinced I was going to lose him with Charlotte I wasn't as convinced because I'd had, you know, another healthy one. Um, again, when I had her, the clinic was wonderful. They did the exact same care system that we had for Liam, which was really relieving to me because I kind of thought that I had this feeling that they were going to be like, well, no, you had one already that was mm -hmm. fine, so she's not high risk. But um, she was. They took, they took really good care of us. Um, and I remember, like, feeling a little bit more around 28, 30-ish weeks, feeling a little bit more comfortable, like starting to think, you know what, maybe I don't need to be induced at 37 weeks. Maybe I can just wait, because I know this is my last one, I'm not having any more. Maybe I can just wait and go into labor naturally and whatever, and then there was one day where I was doing a photo shoot. She was 30, I think I was 34, maybe 35 weeks pregnant with her. I was doing a newborn session. Um, so, you know, I'm moving around the whole time, whatever, and it ended and I was like, okay, like when's the last time I felt you kick? And I just started poking at her mm -hmm. and then she started kicking and let me know she was okay. And I was like, okay, no, yeah, we're definitely still getting induced in two weeks. Like I'm done. I'm not doing this anymore. <laughs> I'm done worrying. <laughs> this is so terrifying. Yeah. It's just, it's, it's just, it's hard. Do you believe in mother's intuition? I think I do now. Mm -hmm. I feel like if I would have just gone into the hospital with him, he'd probably be here. But that's the other thing that's really, really hard with rainbow babies and losing a baby is again, like you said, like um, the timeline, like if Sawyer hadn't passed away, Liam wouldn't be here. Mm -hmm. And if Liam wasn't here, Charlotte probably wouldn't be here either. And um, there was this, one of these uh, blogs that I had read on, I think it's still standing, stillstanding.com is a magazine for stillbirths for parents and grandparents of stillborn babies um they were talking about the juxtaposition of rainbow babies and basically like i wouldn't give i wouldn't i wouldn't trade liam and lottie for anything in the in the world but if sawyer was here i would have said the same thing about him mm -hmm. so especially having liam like after we had him there was a good probably the first six months of his life that everything he did brought me so much joy and also so much sadness because his older brother wasn't, didn't get the chance to do that. Like mm -hmm. he didn't, yeah, sorry. Do you have advice for parents who are grieving, who have had a stillborn baby? I would say, you can't blame yourself. If you knew that this was coming, you would have done everything in the world to stop it. Um, <laughs> sorry, it's hard. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I think the important thing is not to blame yourself 
and to take your time. However, that may come when it comes to grieving. Some days are good and some days are bad. Well, and that's that's something I've really realized in mm -hmm. this journey that um, like he'll be he would be seven on May first, and anniversaries are hard. This time of year is hard because leading up to like you know the last like trimester of your pregnancy you are so excited and counting down and waiting and walking and drinking red raspberry leaf tea and doing all the things and so i have all of these and not even facebook memories just like as soon as the weather changes in march and it starts to get a little warmer and there's that fresh crisp smell immediately my heart plummets mm -hmm. because it just it just hurts and as we get closer to his birthday it hurts and it's and it's it's hard but that said, I'm not, I'm a different person than I was before I lost him, but I am also a different person than I was right after I lost him. Mm -hmm. There is definitely this strength that comes from surviving something that you think is going to completely tear you apart. Mm -hmm. um, and like, I don't know how... I'm never going to get over him. Like that's never, I'm always going to grieve him. I'm always going to miss him because I'm always going to love him. Mm -hmm. And I've talked to women who had stillbirths 20 some years ago and they still, they still have moments where it just takes their breath away and they just feel so broken and like right back to that day again. And I do too, like I have my moments, but they're fewer and far between. Mm -hmm. I want to thank you for coming on the show and being so brave. I think today's show will add to what you've already done to progress the community and help other mothers and other families through pregnancy loss. Thank you so much, Thanks Ashley. for having me. I also just really quickly wanted mm -hmm. to mention to you that the one thing that really helped me as well was um, I, when right before we got pregnant with Liam, I, a woman reached out to me whose sister had just found out that she'd lost her baby at 36 mm -hmm. weeks and asked me if I could come and do photos for them in the hospital. And because Kimberly had given me this amazing gift, and it actually, I believe that it was kind of like a God thing because mm -hmm. Caitlin had, like Caitlin Blake with Wild at Heart, had just had her daughter Eliza by C-section. Kimberly was in Ireland and there was nobody else in the community that I would trust to go and do this. So I had to go and do these photos. And then two weeks later, I found out I was pregnant with Liam. And since then I've done stillbirth photos three or four times now. And every time I feel like it's giving Sawyer's life a little bit of meaning because um, if I hadn't lost him, I wouldn't be doing this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was the other thing I wanted to say. <laughs> well, thank you, Ashley. And thank you. thank you so much for sharing your story today. Thanks for having me. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the Jenna Colburn Show. That was a clip from the NBC show New Amsterdam, which featured a episode which had the cuddle cot in it. The Bonneville Hospital has recently purchased a cuddle cot similar to that, as shown in that video there, and it allows for families to have more time with their babies. On today's Community Futures Lakeland feature, I wanted to show a community service that is now available. So the cuddle cot really extends the time that families are able to be with their stillborn child. How long is really dependent on a number of variables, but um, Prior to the cuddle cot, it was really only a few hours, and our special guest today, Ashley Hempel, spoke on that, that they were, there was only a couple hours that they were able to spend with their baby Sawyer before um, nature took over. And this is really like a key piece of equipment for supporting families after the loss of a baby, allowing extra time and slowing down um, the nat natural process really helps them make decisions and, you know, it allows them to grieve in their own way. So dealing with death of a baby is an incredibly difficult event for bereaved parents, and it's important that they are provided options for spending time with their baby. There is a limited re window of time 
where bereaved pa parents can cre create those special memories and bond with the baby. And in some cases, with speaking to the Bonneville Hospital, some parents have chose to take pictures, much like our guest today, Ashley Hempel. Others have changed diapers, dressed the babies, taken um, those special moments, allowing other family members to come in to see the baby, um, really just staying close and helping families deal with their loss. I wanted to share with you some of the programs available that are through the Bonneville Healthcare Centre. They have a really great program that's actually province-wide. It's the Alberta Angel Dresses. So um, people have donated wedding dresses to this cause. And from the wedding dresses, they create these gowns, beautiful gowns for the babies to have final photos or perhaps a bur burial service. And really, there's no greater gift to be given to a grieving family than affirming the importance of life with this simple gift. So it's a very, very great organization, Alberta Angel Dresses, and it's available through the Bonneville Hospital, it's available through hospitals local to Lakeland as well as provincially in Alberta. There's also the Twinkle Star Project. It's a, bas it's a basket project that was created out of love and respect for the families experiencing um, perinatal loss. Each um, handmade kit and crocheted ba basket is created with the size and delicate state of babies they hold in mind. They ensure that families are given time to properly cradle their babies close to them. With the baskets, families are reminded that um, someone is thinking of them and their circumstances during this extremely difficult time and that holding their baby close is such a beautiful extension of their love for them. There's also um, special wooden memory boxes available for early miscarriage loss. And the Bonneville Hospital noted that they are extremely proud of the services that they have been able to offer and the growing services and the growing community that's available to parents suffering um, prenatal loss as stillbirth or miscarriage. There's also access to local bereavement photography, such as what Ashley Hempel had used, and there's spiritual services available and blessing and naming services as well as counseling. So all of these services are available at the Bonneville Hospital and locally at other Lakeland hospitals. There's similar programming, but Bonneville did just receive a cuddle cot, which is going to go a long way to help the community here in Bonneville. We'll be right back on the Jenna Colburn Show. Welcome back to the Jenna Colburn Show. Very excited to have on Skype this morning, Olivia Rose. Olivia, thank you so much for joining me. Hey, Jenna, how are you? How have you been? Long time no see. I know, it has been quite a while. There was a while where we were seeing quite a lot of each other. You were touring in the area a bit, and then, of course, the pandemic. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So let me ask you that first. What have you been doing during the pandemic? Have you been just being creative, writing, making music? Yeah, totally. So obviously I was able to do a release in the pandemic, which was really incredible. Um, even though it didn't quite live up to exactly what I wanted the release to look like, I was actually supposed to be on tour in Ontario uh, for this release. But that's okay. You know, things happen. Um, but I've been really keeping busy with lots and lots of songwriting. Um, there was a while there where I didn't songwrite at all. And once I kind of got back into it, um, I figured out that that's kind of, that was my happy place during quarantine was those little creative moments that I was able to take during the day. So lots of writing and lots of doing business stuff for my music on the back end, like making the websites all good and all that stuff like that. Well, let's kind of cycle back to before the pandemic, you and I had spoke and you had just graduated high school and we were talking mm -hmm. about what was next for you. And one of your dreams was to go down to Nashville. Now I'm wondering, were you able to make it to Nashville or did the pandemic kind of halt your plans? Yeah, not quite. Um, as the pandemic kind of started happening, I was looking into applying for a visa and stuff like that, because that all takes a lot of time too. Um, and was planning on hopefully being down in Nashville around this time of 2021, um, but that got all, all halted. <laughs> 
Well, you started out singing very young. Um, you're from Elk Point, Alberta. Around middle school, you decided to move to Edmonton and you went to the Victoria School of Arts, which is just amazing. Um, you've since graduated and moved on. But starting music so young in a small town, did you ever imagine that you would get to the place you are today? I mean, I was definitely a big dreamer as a kid. Um, so when I was younger and chose this as a career, I didn't really have any plans of stopping. So <laughs> I think I imagined that by, tw oh, by 21, that's so old. I'll be on the main stages at Big Valley Jamboree. <laughs> well, you're not too far off. Without the pandemic, I think you would have been on a fast track to playing those huge festivals. And I know you were playing quite a few around here. You opened up for Brett Kissel and his festival. And then you also did Mudfest here in Bonneville. Mm. So you were on your fast track to be hitting those festivals. Have you gotten any word about the summer of 2021 and whether or not um, festivals are going to be happening or if you're a part of them? Well, um, some festivals are still having open applications for artists, um, so they're still trying to move on with putting them on, but it's never quite a guarantee, obviously, as we know, things can turn around in an instant, and so I've been applying to some festivals, I may have gotten some confirmation from some others, and hopefully this summer will be a much better one than last. Well, let's talk about uh, what you were doing during the whole pandemic when the world stopped and what kept you busy because I did see you released some new music, Songtress of Light, your latest album came out and you just released a new song called Gold that's been getting a lot of airplay. So can we talk about the album and maybe a bit about the song as well and what it means to you? Um, I'm, I haven't released an album, so I'm not sure where <laughs> whose album that you're speaking about is, but Gold is mine, yes. Um, Gold, I was able to release that song during quarantine. As I said earlier, I was supposed to be on tour in Ontario during this time, um, during the release of Gold, but that didn't happen, but I still was able to do a really awesome release from home, and I got to make a gorgeous lyric video with my good friend Juliana from Not Your Designer. So that was really fun. And Gold is such a happy, upbeat, positive song, and I'm so glad that I was able to release it and kind of give the world and in my own life just a little bit more light and happiness. And I think that that's something we all kind of need a little bit more of these days. I have to agree, and I do apologize. Maybe I was just like <laughs> looking into the future and making future oh, plans yeah. for you. <laughs> <laughs> Not sure where I got that. I apologize, Olivia, but okay. back to gold and, you know, radio tours is a big part of getting your name out there. A lot of artists go on the road and they stop in at different radio stations and get some airplay that way. Have you been doing a lot of virtual interviews like the one we're doing today? Definitely. Um, my entire week, weeks since releasing gold have just been uh, Skype interviews, phone interviews, and even a lot of type up interviews. Um, and those have been mostly for the publicity side of gold. Now that it's released to radio, because it just came out on radio last week, I'm going to be starting to do doing some more uh, radio stuff. Um, I already did one with my good friend, Sarah Scott, and it should be really good. It's been getting some really, really great um, play so far, even though it's only been out for a week. And I actually got confirmation that on Friday, it was the second most downloaded country song in Canada, the radio. That's absolutely amazing. Yeah. <laughs> you describe the song as like bubbly and fun. And I think that's how I would describe you to people if they ever ask, <laughs> well, what's Olivia like? I would say she's cheery, bubbly and fun. Is that the kind of energy you bring to the stage and to your music when you go out and play? 100%. Um, I'm, I'm such a type personality that I like to make everybody feel really comfortable around you um, and it makes me really happy to see people kind of just let loose and, and break down any guards that they may have and just be themselves. And so I, I do think I try to put on that type of personality and I am that type of personality that makes people just want to relax and have a good time. Well, let's dream big. Let's say the world opens up. What are you doing this year? Well, I mean, Without the pandemic, I have been actually writing an album, and so I'm still writing that and working on that. So hopefully, when the world opens up, I can actually get um, into the recording studio with everybody in the same room and really create some magic on an album. Tell me about the inspiration behind what you're writing right now. 
Um, a lot of it comes from being stuck inside and being a little bit sad and lonely because of the pandemic. Um, but a lot of it is really just um, storytelling so that it gets me out of my brain of the day-to-day -day annoying quarantine life. And I can kind of create a story um, using these fictional characters, kind of like you see somebody like Taylor Swift do in her Folklore and Evermore album. And it's really fun because just like if I was a, a, a writer of a book, I'm able to make these little characters and give them a world to live in that's not ours right now. <laughs> Do you have a go-to team that you work with for writers or producing your music? Uh, for sure. I mean, definitely for songwriting, there's a circle that if you get into it, you start writing with everybody is writing with the same people. Um, so I'm writing with some really, really incredible people right now, including uh, Lydia Sutherland, Parker Gray, Rich Cloak, uh, Greg Williams, TJ Simpson. They're all so, so incredible. And they've really pushed me um, to be a better songwriter this year because they are all super incredible professional songwriters. And when I first was going into the rights with them, I was a little nervous, um, but they really helped me step out of my skin and be a confident songwriter. So it's been really, really fun. Do you ever feel like nervous about putting yourself out there through your music? Um, that's a good question because yeah, I'm sure sometimes I have those feelings, but the older I get and the more comfortable I get with myself, um, those feelings kind of just go away because I'm creating art and art that I like. And then I know other people will like as well. So where can we find you and download your latest song? For sure. So I'm on Instagram at Olivia Rose underscore music. TikTok at Olivia Rose underscore music, everywhere else just at Olivia Rose music. And you can find all of my music on any streaming platforms that you like to use at Olivia Rose. And my new song is called Gold. Well, thank you so much for hanging out with us today, Olivia. Thank you. And have a wonderful afternoon. You as well. Have a good one. Trending this week, Olivia Rose, her song Gold is available for download and it's actually number two most downloaded song in Canada right now. Thank you for joining me, Olivia. And I have to thank our special guest today, Ashley Hempel, for sharing her story of her baby Sawyer and her rainbow babies, Liam and Charlotte. I really do appreciate the share. And I do believe by sharing these stories, by talking about the tragedies in our lives, it helps us overcome them and it makes our community stronger. So I definitely appreciate our special guest today, Ashley Hempel. And I think the community as a whole is really excited for the kettle cots that are now at the Bonneville Hospital. Thank you so much to my producer, Chris, for putting the show together and our sponsors, Community Futures Lakeland, for helping us get live on the Jenna Colburn Show. And of course, you for joining in, commenting, getting in on the conversation, hitting share and coming back each and every Wednesday at two o'clock right here on Lakeland Connect for the Jenna Colburn Show.